caring, feeding, and protecting them through the word of God. Come on, put your hands together for our vision. The mission of Champions for Christ is to restore the fallen, seek the lost, and ensure the spiritual health of the community through biblically educating, empowering, and inspiring the people to walk in the commission God has purposed for their lives. All right, come on, put your hands together one more time. We'll be reading the morning, this morning a very familiar script that comes out of Psalms 113, and it reads, Praise the Lord, you servants, praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sits. The name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raised the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes. With the princes of people, he settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of her children. If you would, join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this great day. Father, for how the sun rose on this morning, Father, we did not have to worry. Father, that our faith wasn't even activated, Father, in the wonderful things you do. For you are God of miracles, a God of blessings a God that goes exceedingly and beyond what it is our expectations are. Father, you know what we are in need of. Father, we come to your house to receive. Father, but also to give you glory, honor, and praise. For it is our reasonable service. Father, permeate this sanctuary on this morning. Father, even through the airways, Father, that those, Father, who join us on today, Father, will get a great word. Father, we'll have opportunity to praise you and bless you, Father, to even give you a small fraction of what you do for us. Father, we pray for those, Father, who are sick on this morning. Father, by your stripes, they are healed. Father, we're asking for strength, Father, in their faith, in their inner being, Father, in their spiritual being. Father, we're asking that they be, Father, given the nutrients that they need. Father, that will provide them strength. Father, we thank you right now, Father, for all that you're doing, Father. We thank you right now for the leaders of this ministry. Father, we also thank you, Father, for the parishioners, Father, and the servants of this ministry. Father, let us be blessed beyond measure, Father. And for this, we'll give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hallelujah. How many of y'all are ready to praise God this morning? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So you can definitely help us out with this song. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.
together to God be the glory, honor, and praise. Come on, don't doubt him this morning. Trust him. Don't doubt him this morning. Trust him. I'll bless his name at all times and his praises. Yes, his praises shall continuously. Somebody help me say it. Be in my mouth. It's an honor to be before you this morning. I thank God from whom all blessings flow. Today that God is still on the throne of grace. That God is still a good God no matter what somebody say or what your circumstances may appear to be. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. That blows my mind. Above all that we can ask or think. Anything that you can imagine, God can do it. And the very things that God has in store for you that you don't see, know that God is able. I'm telling I'm, I'm excited today. I want to thank God again from whom all blessings flow this morning, that God has a rhema word for us on today, that we'll be able to go ahead and finish this series up entitled, When Will God Show Up? Amen. When will God show up? I would ask at this time, if you'll stand with me, God bless those who are watching by way of television and those who are on their ways to the church house. Those who are on the road today but still listening to us and took time out for that, we give God praise. And we thank God this morning. Psalms chapter 6, and today I just want to dissect the scriptures of verses 6 and 7. Amen. 6 and 7. Amen. We finna nail this thing in the coffin. Man, we've had a lot of meeting. Now it's time to put everything together. And we're going to watch. And it says right here that David wrote in verse 6, I am worn out from my groaning. He said, I am worn out from groaning. Have you, have you ever been at a point to where you, you're so tired of a situation, you're tired of hearing yourself pray for that situation? Oh, that's, that's real talk. Now, you... You're, I'm so tired of my situation. And I, I'm tired of praying. I'm tired of hearing myself say this, this prayer that seems to have become redundant because I'm saying it so much. I'm tired of hearing my own groaning, my own pain and my own spiritual suffering because there's no suffering like spiritual suffering. I know we we think ear aches are tough and, and toothaches are horrible, but there's nothing like spiritual suffering. And he says in verse 7, my eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. He says, my eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. You've been crying so much till you have no more liquidation in your tear ducts. What do you do even when crying isn't enough? People tell you a lot of times that if I, if I just cry, I can get it out. But what happens when you cry and you scream and it's still with you? you it's some things in life that are challenging that you ever felt like you couldn't shake something? No matter what you tried to do, I, I repented, I went to church, I went to bed early, I started working out, and it seems like I still could not make the connection of how I got over, or how I moved on, or how God kept me or sustained me. You, you start to ask yourself, is God real? Why did this have to happen to my children? Or, why can't my children be Rhodes Scholars or Scholastic Scholars? Why is it I had to get a deadbeat husband? Why, why is it that why, 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 why? God, I'm doing all I can do. Why, 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 why? The why is killing me. It's causing me to be drained in my spirit and give up hope. The Bible tells us hope deferred. Give strength to the heart. Father, we thank you for such a wonderful group of people in such a wonderful place at such a wonderful time. It's, it's always a great time, God, when you put your menu out and allow us to choose, God, today 
that we can eat something spiritual nourishing that will continue to enhance our appetite and build on our strengths so you get the glory. You get the under and all the praise. Now, anoint these ears so these people might hear. Their hearts, they might receive. Speak through my vocal cords so they can hear from heaven. Remove William and speak through me to these, your people. Oh, so somebody's life will be changed. Somebody will be remortified. Somebody will start standing up. Let somebody be lifted up in the spirit this morning. That is my prayer, that no one leaves this place the same way they came. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Now let the church say amen. Amen. Tell somebody I'm part of the new generation. No, that's the wrong person. Tell somebody who for real this morning. I'm, I'm part of the new generation. Yeah, not, not the generation that deals with, with age. Not the generation that deals with age, but, but the generation that's Christ-like. We, we, we characterize everything according to population or, or to gender or through ethnicity. But I'm talking about a generation that, that's just one come one all. I'm talking about the generation that's Christ-like. And Christ-like generations, they all have something in common. They all get to the place when they ask God at some point, during their journey, when are you going to show up? Because there's no way that you can serve God forever in eternity and not come to a place where you don't feel like God has left you. The reason I know this is because God has to put us in a place sometime where he puts us on an island to see how much he can trust us. He, he wants to see how much we believe in him. He, he wants to see that, are you for real? Or are you one of those placators? Or are you some, sometime is somebody? No, God wants to see. So at some point, God is going to put you in a situation where you're going to ask God, God, when are you going to show up? Why y'all left me? Why am I up here by myself? Lord, you've forsaken me. I pay my tithes and I pay my offerings, Lord, and I'm of good strength, Lord, and I sing on the praise team. I do everything in the church, even things I'm not gifted to do, I do them. I, I watch the kids and I, I try to have aid the pastor, and it's still like all hell is just breaking loose in my life. Every day I have a storm brewing. I don't know what sunshine looks like. I don't know what it means to smile. It is sad when you have to force a smile. It's sad when people have to force a smile. David has been talking to God in this chapter, and he's explaining to God, Lord, when I need you, God, you are not here. All the other things I've done, you were there. But, but for this particular situation, you are not here. You knew that God was good to you when you, when you were sick. And he healed you. He, not only did he heal you, but he delivered you from smoking cigarettes. And he's done all these things that was hard. But now you're mad at God because you didn't get the promotion on your job. You was counting on that promotion because... That was going to give you the extra money you needed so you and your kids can go on vacation next year. Or you can get an automobile. Or, you know, I can finally get bunk beds for the kids. And somebody got that job that wasn't near as qualified as you were in your eyes. But the Bible says eyes haven't seen. Ears haven't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. The good thing, God, about it. Watch what it says right here. The good thing that God what, has in store, Jesus Christ. Here we go. No, There's something in store for you that God has for you that's going to take time. We got to start getting to the point to where we elevate our spirit and say, Spirit, rejoice in our time of waiting because my change going to come. There's a soul next to saying, I, I might not get that with you, but my God going to get me there in his time, in his appointed time. I know God is able. I just got to wait my time. I got to be patient. 
The Bible says, let patience have her perfect works. God tells us all these things and he encourages us and motivates us through inspiration that if you wait on the Lord, he will. Some Bible say he shall renew my what? My strength. I grow stronger the longer that I wait. The longer I have to wait, the more I grow stronger. The longer I have to endure, the more God is building me. The longer I stay patient, the more God is molding me. I want to be, tell a neighbor I want to be molded. Oh, I, I want to be, I want to be molded. Because we have the questions of when will God show up? Like David had the question. David got to the point to where his dialogue stopped making sense. He started telling God in the text that, that, you know, if I die, I can't worship you. You're giving God an ultimatum. How many of y'all have given God an ultimatum? If you don't do this, then I'm going back to sinning. If, if you don't do this, we don't say it, but we show it. Let, let, me, let, me, let me clarify this. Let me justify this. We, we don't go and tell God, no, I ain't going to do that. We just show him. I just go back to what I was doing. I go back to drinking. I go back to cussing. I go back to fornication. I go back to adultery. I go back to lying to people, cheating people, backstabbing, hamstringing. I go back to those things. I didn't pronounce it. I did something worse than speak it. I showed it. Then we come back and tell God, I love you, and cry and say, God, I'm confused. You're not confused. You chose. You're not confused. You chose which road you wanted to take. You, you chose whether I will complain of my sickness or I rejoice in it. Jeez, I need somebody this morning. Who, I need somebody came up here. Because little David, little John, all we do is complain about our issues. We never rejoice in the battle. We don't rejoice in our storms. We use that time to complain. And God say, how you going to serve an awesome God and you complaining because it's raining? No, no. Enjoy the rain because the earth needs to rain so that it can be moisturized and cultivate the earth. So when, when it's raining on your parade, on your dream, on your vision, understand that God is cultivating it. He's cultivating your vision through precipitation. What's the precipitation? The spirit. The spirit looms on water. Yeah, so now he, he, he's cultivating me through the rain. The problem is I don't have an umbrella for shelter. God say, I intended for you to get wet. I'll tell somebody, God wants you to get wet. Yeah, God wants you to get wet this morning. I got somebody in who had sleep. You should have stayed home. Yeah, no. Nah, yeah, God wants you to get wet. You, the one who sleep, he wants you to be drenched. We don't understand how we grow. You grow with precipitation. You grow with failure. You can never truly succeed until you fail. Adam proved it. Adam proved it. Adam didn't, didn't really appreciate God until after he sinned. That's when, he, that's when fear came on the scene. Once he sinned, fear came. If he had never sinned, there are some things that we ingest right now that we would never have to ingest. He didn't realize that the precipitation of the rules that God had given him was there to help him. He didn't say nothing. Eve does what she does, and now we have suffered, not because of Eve, but because of Adam. He refused to be watered with the responsibility that God had given him which is directive, which is don't eat from this tree of good and evil. We blame it on Eve because she was the one talking to Satan, but where was her man? God never gave responsibility to the woman nowhere in chapter 2 of Genesis. He gave all the responsibility to man, but yet, like we always have done, we try to find a way in the text to put it on woman when God made the man the head. And when he rained down on man and through all this time, this turmoil, all God was doing was injecting responsibility in man. Before he made woman, he tells man all these things that man has to do. 
Name the animals, the ones in the sky. Name the ones on the land. Name the ones in, in the water. Then he comes back and tells him, cultivate this land. He gives man responsibility. Tell man quickly. He tells man that man shouldn't be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. Then he go right back and do what? Give him more responsibility. He gave man all the responsibility man needed before he gave man woman. And then when he gave him woman, he expects man to exercise this responsibility. And what man do? Man stay silent. He watched the woman move in silence and watch her sin and then want to blame it on her. What did he tell God? So you gave me her. <laughs> I gave you her so you can exercise how I taught you how to take care of responsibility. But you failed the test, and now everybody has to be reigned upon. Jesus, God, when you going to show up? God, why must we continue to live they sins? That's what I have asked. Why do we have to continue to live their sins? Well, he said, well, the same way people now, their children live their bloodline. You look at the bloodline, you see the child. You almost know a child before the child born by the bloodline. <laughs> this is, Lord have mercy. You almost, I don't know how much hair they're going to have, but I know the attitude they're going to bring. Yeah, I don't know how, how, how long the hair going to be, but I know how sassy she going to be. Look at her mama. Sassy got to come out that wound. Spirit ain't coming out of that. We're going to have to work on that. So God said, I got to let it always work. have a form of precipitation in your life so that you will understand or understand the need of when I show up. See, we always want God to show up. And we don't know why he show up. We think minutely. We think that God show up for our need. Yes, we do. Because that's how we pray. We pray, God, help me get this house. And God say, I'm bigger than that. I'm bigger than that. It's like a dad doing, doing Father's Day. Only thing he get is a handkerchief. He forces a smile and walks away and say, I'm bigger than that. But John, they don't like us this morning. But it's the truth. It's the truth, Aunt. God's the same way. God looks and says, I'm bigger than that. All you see me as is a gift spreader of cars. All you see me as are gift spreaders of houses. All you see me as a gift spreader of a wife. All you see me as a gift spreader of a good job. <laughs> it's bigger than this with God. That's why God makes us wait, because we never grasp the concept of why he do what he do and how he move like he move and what's the outcome of it that he wants us to have in the conclusion. All we learn, and that's the church fault, because we, we tell the congregation, fake it till you make it. I'm going to fake something with a real God. Satan, see, Satan used us like that with little slick slogans. That, that gets into our spirit and become antiquated. Yeah, fake it till you make it. Why do I serve a live, living God and I got to fake it? Either it's happening or it isn't. Or it's going to happen, it's just not time. It's going to happen, it's just not time. Oh, you're going to get your life back, it just ain't time. God got to develop you in some places so when the blessings come and what he's given, you can handle them. So today you don't have to shout for what God's going to do, you have to shout for where you are in God. I got to shout today because God didn't never leave me. That's why I'm shouting today. I got to shout today because God has never forsaken me. I got to shout today because God never left me. Oh, that's why I'm shouting today. I'm shouting today not asking God when he's going to show up. I'm praying to God because he never left me. Jesus. I'm sorry. I fake it till you make it. That's a lie from hell. I don't have to fake nothing with a real God. My God is my own. My circle glory. Why do I have to fake it? It is what it is. And I am who I am. Like God told Moses, 
who should I tell them sent me? God said, tell them I am that I am. He didn't say fake it till you make it. He said, I am that I am. You think I'm poor today, but I'm rich in spirit. Oh, you think I'm down and downtrodden, but I'm happy and glorious. Oh, yes, you got me jacked up from the floor. Why? We don't understand the why when it comes to waiting on God. When is God going to show up? God's never left you. You don't understand the equations and the equivalence of how God thinks. We are predicating our thinking off of our flesh, which is connected to wants. Why would I have to want when God has already given? I, I shouldn't have to get, I don't have to want for nothing if the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell in. I don't have to want for nothing. It's already here. I'm just waiting patiently on the Lord. Because if he give it to me too prematurely, I can't handle it. If he give it to me too prematurely, I will make a mess. Quit asking God when and thank God for being God. If being God being God, that lets you know that it's in God's timing. He says it, it over uh, in the book, of, to everything there's a time, a season, and a purpose why we don't live off of that? We only use that for, for burials and funerals. But no, it's for your everyday life. I'm walking every day and it's to everything. There's a time, a season, and a purpose. For everything, there's a time, a season, and a purpose. For everything, there's a time, a season, and a purpose in my life. It ain't happened yet, but tell somebody to keep watching. It's going to happen. Yeah, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, you're going to laugh for real after a while. When God show up, we can't even glorify or try to justify what he look like. So we really don't know when God show up. We think God showed up. Pastor Summers, we think God showed up. Not when, when he's doing it. We give God praise after it's done. <laughs> we prostitute God. We do our best to prostitute him. He won't let us. But I should rejoice in my time of trouble because that's when he's showing up in my time of trouble. I don't need to rejoice when I come out. I need to rejoice when I'm coming, Jesus. He bringing me out. He bringing me out. I don't have to, I'm, I'm rejoicing. I got the house. Rejoice before you fill out the contract. I'm, I'm getting ready to get married. Uh, you, ain't, I ain't even, you ain't got a boyfriend yet. No, but it's coming. I'm, just, I'm coming. I'm healed, delivered, and set free of every illness and infirmity that the canker worm, the pummer worm, and the lotus tried to. I, I, I feel great because God's going to do it. My bed is going to relish because God's already moving. He's moving in silence on my behalf. I don't have to see what I already know. Jesus. Tell a neighbor when he show up. Yeah, not when he go, why he go, but when he show up. When he show up, he comes with something called omnipotence, a dictatorship. Yeah, it's a different type of dictatorship. It's not a Hitler dictatorship. It's a God's dictatorship. What it mean? When he come, what he say moves. Uh, move, move, die. Live, rise. Omnipotence. Omnipotence means unlimited power. God has an unlimited power in him. So when he come, omnipresence show up. There's an unlimited power coming. That's when God make you say, what? How did this happen? What? I can't believe this. What? Look at my God, what? Won't he do it? The third part of omnipotence is supremacy. Oh, he comes with supremacy. I mean, he's over everything. He rules over everything. Oh, the eye, the sky, the earth, and the land. Oh, he even has rule over Satan. For somebody who didn't realize 
He gave Satan what he has. So when God comes in omnipotence, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. That's one reason when he shows up. When he shows up, number two is he brings with him sovereignty. Sovereignty comes with him. What does sovereignty mean? Riri, sovereignty means he has jurisdiction. Oh, oh, he has rule over every place. His feet planted. He said, everywhere my feet trod, that ground becomes holy. What he's really saying is I have supremacy. I have sovereignty. Everywhere. What people say, watch my shadow. And people get healed off my shadow. What he's saying is I have sovereignty. Unmeasurable sovereignty. That means wherever I go, I am. And wherever I am, you are. And wherever you are, you healed. And wherever I am, you are. And where you are, you're delivered. And wherever I am, you are. And where I am, you set free. Why? Why? Because who the Son set free, yes, is free indeed. I'll let nothing separate me from God's omnipotence and God's sovereignty. And next he come with the 13. It's called benevolence. <laughs> Jesus. Woo! The 13 is deliverance. Oh, Why? Do I know when he show up? Because I understand the omnipotence. I understand his sovereignty. And now I understand his benevolence. What does that mean? Compassion. I know he's there. I know he's where I am because of his compassion. I know because he has compassion for me. That can nobody restore me or refrain me from doing what my mind wanted to do? Oh, he can frame me. He refrained me through compassion. What did he do? He, he gave me goodwill. He said, be of good cheer. I've already overcome this world. Yes, yes. Well, so when he show up, what does he do? God deals decisively, watch this, and ruthlessly with the afflictions of the afflicted. Decisively means particularly, succinctly, with the afflictions of those who are afflicted. They ain't here in this hell to tench. Let me go over here. Because somebody got to rejoice that when God comes compassionately, he's coming to deal with the afflictions that the afflicted are dealing with. So he ain't coming to deal with you. He's coming to get the poison out of you. He wants you to just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I'm coming out. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. God is saying, I'm coming. If you just hold on to my unchanging hand. Here's the question. Here's the question. Why does God wait until the last minute to intervene? I'm sure 99.9% of the pastors, Pastor Summer, are going to ask that question. Why are you waiting so long, God, to intervene? This, get this devil out my church. Uh, uproot this devil. Why this thorn is constantly in my side? If you can get this one thorn out, the whole church will shout amen. Everything will be glorified. And God, then you can be magnified. And God say, no way. Uh, I need that thorn in you. I, I need that thorn in you because it reminds you of who you need. See, if I don't need a thorn in you, you will never cry for help. You'll look inside of you for your answers. And the side that ain't in you, inside you, it's only when I'm in you, then greater is he who is in me. It's greater than he who is in the world. But you don't have God in you. So when you're asking God to work through you, you get a dud. Because he's not there. And it's not because he don't want to be there. It's because he's uninvited. And Christians will not invite God into their most deepest places because they don't want God to know their secrets as if they don't understand that God is sovereign and he already know what you have need of before you ask. Walk into church all pritzy 
and you got your pumps on and your nice purse and you think you saved only to yourself. Satan laughs at you and say, you've already been destroyed, self-destructed. Let me go over here and get somebody who's trying to get saved for real. A lot of people in church don't have problems because they're no threat to the enemy. I'm looking for those who hungry, who ready to eat off the flow for Christ and say, for God I live, for God I die. Blessed be the name. <laughs> oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's why. Now he says this right here. He says, you say days are passing or you become exhausted or, or you, you, you feel like you're a dead man walking. Yeah, and the gossip corner has started to, 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 to sink in on you. You see them gossiping about you. You know the gossip corner. That they starting to talk about you. And you keep trucking, but you don't have too much more strength. And you ask God, when, God? When, God? Yeah, and right when you begin to expect the fact that he's not going to answer, what does he do? He intervenes. Oh, he intervenes. He intervenes right at the last. When you're on your last breath, or they say good to the last drop, right on your last drop, God shows up right on your last drop. God starts to deliver on your last drop. God starts to have a breakthrough on your last drop. God see you through. Somebody say, yeah. So now, if God sh show it, we want him to be there. We need to learn of him. We, we need to learn. If he show up, we need to learn what's inside us, what has been instilled when he's finally show up. One thing is patience. Yeah, patience. We have to learn patience. What is patience? Tolerance. Tolerance. Some things you have to tolerate. Yeah, some things God going to make you stay in that circle on that carousel until you learn how to tolerate some things. Your patience work in virtue. I got to learn how to endure this so I can move to the next obstacle. But I can't move, and I don't care how much the pastor lay hands on me, how much they pray and intercede for me. At some point, it becomes my test. At some point, I got to stand up and say, this is me. This is how I'm dressed because this is how I've lived. This is how I look, and this is how I think because this is how I've been moving. But I'm finna change. I'm going to pass this test. Yeah, It won't get me again. Oh, this test won't get me again. No, I won't fall again. You got me two times, but I won't fall again. No, one time shame on me, two times shame on Satan. You won't get me with the same thing twice. I'm sorry, patience. Somebody say patience. Tolerance and restraint come when you realize why God made you wait. He increased my level of patience. He increased my level of restraint. Now I'm not cussing people out when they talk about me. Why? Because I got patience. Now I'm not leaving the church because I'm mad. Why? Because I have restraint now. Now I understand how God moves. And God going to put some sticker brows in certain places to make you feel uncomfortable. But in the uncomfortableness, God going to let you see that I am God. And you're stronger than you think. Tell a neighbor, you stronger than you think. Yes. Now the patience comes steadfast. Steadfast. I've learned from waiting on God that I'm steadfast. What is steadfast? Loyal. Ah, ah, loyal. I'm steadfast. We're using it as steadfast, unmovable. No, but what is steadfast? I'm loyal. I'm loyal beyond a fault. We always want God to wait on us. And get teed off when we have to wait on him. We get teed off and we want to quit him because we had to wait a week too long. We feel like he forgot us. And because we haven't endured enough to enhance the steadfastness in our spirit, we don't want to wait. We don't want to be faithful or committed through being steadfast. When you're steadfast, you're committed to something. You know why we have so many divorces now? People aren't steadfast. They think the person they married should be perfect. We don't have as many Christians as we should because people think when they become saved and pay their tithes two times, God should answer prayers. They don't realize he's already answered the prayers 
He's waiting on the manifestation. Yes, steadfastness, loyal and faithful, committed and devoted. Ask yourself a quick pop quiz question. How devoted are you to your relationship with Christ? You don't have to have an IQ for this. You know where you are. And ask, is the weakness that's hindering you, is it prohibiting you from a, a bona fide relationship with God? Mm. Lastly, unmovable. Unmovable. So we're patient, steadfast, and unmovable. And I like how they say it over in Isaiah 40 in chapter 8. Chapter 40, verse 8, when he says, Grasses will wither and flowers may fade, but the word of God will do what? Stand forever. That's unmovable. That's unmovable right there. He said the, fire, the, the, the grass will wither and the flowers will fade, but the word of God will stand forever. What happens if we take on that unction? What happens if we take the unction on and say, you know what? I'm going to be unmovable for Christ, man. I don't care who come to church, who go, what they say. You have no heaven or hell to put me in. And most times when people talking to you about church, they're trying to take you away from the church, and they don't even know they're being used and abused by Satan. So when people come to y'all, you do just start praying with them and see how much patience they have. The church is a collective item, meaning that we all have to supply. The scripture says that every joint supply. We blame it on the pastor and the first lady all the time. They, honey, the pastor and the first lady were better. No, you probably talked them away from the church because you weren't strong enough to stand up to them and tell them the right or wrong. So you know what you do? We say this right here. I'm not in it. You know I'm telling the truth. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. That's what people in the church say. They, they, you know why? They selfish. They only want a certificate for themselves. They the kind in school who never got scholar or scholastic certificate. They always got perfect attendance certificate. You were made to go to school probably because you was hungry. There ain't no food at the house. I'm going to school. But when you start getting scholastic, scholastic certificates and things of that nature, it means you've been working. What type of certificate God has for you? Uh, is it just I go to church? Or am I doing something out in the community because I went to church? Yeah. God makes us wait because if he give us what we wanted, we would be less grateful. You'll be less grateful. We probably wouldn't share the experience with others because you think you did it yourself. The greatest part of that is we wouldn't be in awe of God. We wouldn't be in awe. The thing that really got my wife in church, we was in church now. She had started coming to church when we were younger, but she had got uh, diagnosed with lupus at the church. We was at Church of God in Christ, overcoming Church of God in Christ. I tell everybody you need to go to Church of God in Christ for a season. She came to church. She didn't know nobody at the church. She just came, you know, her boyfriend, girlfriend, just what you do. She was just coming to church with me because I asked her to come. The bishop called her out, brought out into the aisle. And said, when you go back to the doctor, the doctor is going to be in awe. Because what he saw during the assessment will be no more. Now, let me show you how, where she was back then, because she don't mind me using her. Back then, her thing wasn't even the cure. Her thing was, who told? Who told? Somebody say, who told? Uh, who told? It don't matter who told, baby, as long as you are delivered. <laughs> she looked around. William, did you say that? To, did you tell the pastor that? Did your mama tell the pastor that? No, we didn't tell the pastor that. God told the pastor that. God knew where your patience level was. Eh? He knew you was about to run out. And he said, I'm going to send a prophet. <laughs> she went back to the doctor, her and her mother. And just like the prophet had prophesied, the doctor said, this is unusual. We, we see nothing. And they look back at the old assessment. And they say, but we see it here, but we don't see it here. This is definitely not usual. But to God it was. 
Because our God was sovereign. To God it was because our God was omnipotent. To God it was because our God was benevolent. Our God can do anything. So when she came out, we was up. from that point on, her life changed. The Bible said God take the foolish things, confine the wise. Sometimes some foolish, and when he put an illness on you, that can't nobody take off but him. There, there's something that pepto bismol and Tylenol and 800 ibuprofen can't deal with. There are some things that can only be moved by the spirit of the Holy Ghost. And God showed himself strong in her life, and she's been a lot better ever since. Now, I ain't saying she's perfect, but she's a lot better than where she was back then. Now she understands that there is a God, and her mistakes are moving forward in God. It's not wondering and pondering or being disillusioned about a God, but truly understanding God in his fullness. Yes, and there's many stories in here where people say, I know there's a God. I know my God is able. God waits to the last minute to display his glory. What is glory? Pastor Summers, people go to church all these years and they hear the terms and can't never define them. And it's the pastor's fault. Because we try to preach people happy instead of inject them with the knowledge and the wisdom of understanding so they can take that with them forever because emotionalism's wear off by the time you get home and watch the Falcons. The Falcons will make your religion wear off. You don't forget what the pastor, didn't that pastor say something today about omni, um, the omni downtown, omni something? Because the Falcons, you got, you got to make sure you, you get this. We watch it. Take notes because that's why we preach it. God waits till the last minute to display his honor because of prestige, honor. He wants you to understand that he's renowned. He, he wants you to see his brightness. He wants you to, 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 to explore him and welcome his splendor into your life. That's glory, his brightness, yeah, his prestige. He wants you to see glory is God's great power. Jesus. It's God's great power. It's his strength. That he's your majesty. Yes. Hebrew's word for glory is kavod. The Hebrew term for glory is kavod. Kavod in Hebrew, which is glory, in our term means importance, respect, and honor. So when the Hebrews say glory to God, what they're saying, I... He's important to me. Kavod, he is respectful to me. Kavod, I honor him. When they're saying glory, we say glory to God because it's a cliche. Oh, glory be to God. No, when you say glory, you're saying God is the most important thing to me. When you say glory, you're saying respect like no other. When, when, you, when you look at it, you say honor God. Lazarus. Lazarus, I'm going to conclude this. Lazarus was a great friend of Jesus. One of Jesus' best friends. And when Lazarus got sick, his sister sit for Jesus. They didn't pray. They sent for the omnipotent one. They sent for the sovereign one. They sent for the benevolent one. They sent for Jesus. Yeah. Jesus heard Lazarus were dead. And he did something unusual. He waited two more days before he died. They missed that. <laughs> Andy, Lazarus was one of his best friends in the world. And he waited where he was two more days. And everybody knew where he was going. He had to go through Judea to get to Jerusalem. But he waited two more days. And people don't understand. They say, why he wait two more days? Why did he? By the time Jesus arrived in Judea, Lazarus had been dead now four days. They tell him on day two he's dead. The word gets to him. He waits two more days before he show up in Judea with Lazarus. 
didn't even have to go. He could have sent his word. John, you know the Bible. He, Jesus could have sent his word and, 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 and Lazarus healed. But he waited two more days before he went. Now it's a total of four days before he go and see about his best friend. Now, if your best friend waited like that, they wouldn't be your bestie no more. Even after you're dead and gone, you're still mad at them. You, I ain't got nothing to say to you if you make it to heaven. I ain't got nothing to do with you. You waited two extra days. You could have been there to help me. I might have survived. Somebody say, but God. Yes. We don't understand that in those ancient times, people believed that the soul stayed around on earth for three days. I feel like I'm teaching Catholic. In ancient times, the body, the people believed that the spirit of the body lingered on earth for three days. So if Jesus would have come within them three days or the next day after they called him and Jesus would have resurrected him, it wouldn't have moved the people. Or better yet, let me say it like this. Jesus wouldn't have got the glory. He waits two days, and the two days is really because I need to go the day after what they believe, they believe in. I got to show them who I am. I am the son of the living God. So he waits two days, and so he gets there on the fourth day. And now that's why the sister's crazy, because if he would have came the third day, oh, Jesus is here. The lifeline is here. He could save Lazarus. But he came the fourth day, and now she's in panic mode because according to their ancient beliefs, the spirit leaves in three. You're a day late, dollar short, God. Have you ever felt like he was a day late and a dollar short in your life? Can you imagine a phantom how she was? Because they knew what he was capable of, but they didn't understand in totality who he was. He waits an additional day to go outside of their custom. So now they can't hang their hat on all spirits linger three days. Now the spirit is gone according to the sister. But they didn't know my Jesus. They, they didn't know my Jesus. By the time he arrived, they felt there was no hope, which is very interesting. I'm going to read one thing in John chapter 4, and we're done. Show you this. Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 11, verse 4. Watch this. Do you have it? Say amen. Look at what Jesus, look at what Jesus said. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. What? The church reader, he didn't say, uh, no. It is for what God's what? Go Come on, somebody got to stand up and get God praise. He, he, he said, this, this, is, this sickness is not for death. It's for God's glory. It's for his glory. He comes back right here and says, glory so that God's son may be what? Glorified through it. I wanted to slow the sermon down because we could have went out on a crescendo. But I want you to understand when God makes you wait, it's because he wants to get the glory out of your life. It's not because of what you want or what you think you have need of. The only thing I have need of is God's salvation. Everything else will pass away. But he says it right here in the text. So that my son would be glorified through this. I deliberately had my son wait an extra day to go against the beliefs of the three-day spirit still lingering. So when he did it, I know it was God. I know nobody can do it but God. 
And he raised Lazarus from the dead. But what's your dead situation? It's never too late. All God asks for is your glory. We give credit so much to losing. We give so much credit to pain and so much credit to long suffering and so much credit to I'm alone and so much credit to God hasn't heard me. God heard your cry. Will you give him the glory? Will you give him the glory even if he don't provide the miracle? He's omnipotent. Sovereign. He's benevolent. Benevolent. He's all those things in one. Those things are glory. So next time when you so loosely say to God be the glory, understand that glory is a worship word. A word that I'm reminded, God, of who you are. You're omnipotent. You're sovereign. You're my dictator. I love when you tell me what I need to do through your word. I, I love when you order my steps. That's the dictatorship I love. That's who you are. He made Lazarus' sister wait of glory. Most of the preachers preach that, that. And Lazarus rose from the dead. The other people rose from the dead. Lazarus wasn't the only one to rise from the dead. God utilized Lazarus' situation to help redefine in people's mindsets what glory is. So when you're waiting on God, understand that glory is being revealed. Jesus waited on the cross. Be your will. Take this cup away from me. God was silent. He said, through your patience, through your suffering, I'll get the glory. I don't know what it is in your life that you're dealing with that has a fish hook in your spirit. Give God the glory for it. Jesus waited to be glorified. He used his best friend Lazarus as an example. Healing Lazarus would have been tremendous. He came in three days. But resurrecting him was mind-blowing. It was awesome. Would you rather live in the tremendous or the mind-blowing? If Jesus would have did it in the confines of the rules that they had in Judea, it would have been tremendous. But he said, I'm not from Judea. I'm the son of the living God. I don't deal in tremendous. I do things that blow your mind. Put your hands together. To God be the glory. Amen. Come on, we can do better than that. You've just had an experience with champions, and we are so glad that you tuned in today. Let's continue to honor God through our commitment to give. There are four ways to give. You can give online via Cash App at dollar sign Champions for Christ. Next, you can give online at www.championsforchristim.org. Lastly, you can give during service or on our mobile app available in the Apple and Google Play stores. Please be sure to tune in each and every week to our online broadcast. Encourage others to tune in with you. Remember, we are champions because we are champions for Christ.